truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Since the founding, Americans have been torn between two competing impulses, each of which is deeply rooted in our national character. Does our belief in the blessings of liberty and representative government impose on us a duty to help others achieve them? Or does our uniquely favorable geography mean that our most natural foreign policy is avoiding foreign entanglements? Arguably, the view that we should keep to ourselves enjoys an older pedigree. In his 1796 farewell address, President Washington warned Americans that, quote, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. And on Independence Day, 1821, Secretary of State and future President John Quincy Adams gave perhaps the most famous formulation of a policy of restraint. Speaking of America, he said, Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will her heart, her benedictions, and her prayers be. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom of independence in all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. In the 20th century, however, many Americans came to a different view. In 1917, in asking Congress to declare war on Imperial Germany, Woodrow Wilson argued that American soldiers must go abroad to achieve world peace and to make our democracy secure at home. Quote, the world must be made safe for democracy, he said. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. Similarly, in his 1961 inaugural address, President Kennedy famously promised that the United States would, quote, pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival, survival and the success of liberty." End quote. Do we have a duty to defend liberty abroad? Do our own freedom and prosperity depend on the success of our values around the world? Or are we better off minding our own business? Tonight's program features two speakers who are eminently well qualified to discuss these issues. Congressman Dan Crenshaw is a former Navy SEAL and represents Texas's second congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives. He serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And William Ruger serves as the president of the American Institute for Economic Research. He's a veteran of the Afghanistan war and remains an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve component. Uh, They have many more accomplishments, but I've been instructed to keep the bios very short. So please join me in welcoming both of them, and I believe Congressman Crenshaw will lead off. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Harlan Crow, for uh, hosting this event. Thank you, Lindsey Craig and National Review for hosting this debate. Uh, thank you, Adam, for, for being here as our, our moderator. Thank you, Will Ruger, uh, for participating. Um, just to be clear, I'm under the impression this is a debate about Ukraine specifically, so um, I'm going to be directing my remarks to that. I know we'll, we'll broaden the conversation as, as we go on, but there's a reason I'm going to only talk about Ukraine over the next 10 minutes, and I'm going to talk very fast so that I don't go over 10 minutes. So the issue before us is to whether it's in our national interest to continue to support Ukraine. And I'll make arguments based on steely-eyed reality. I will not construct straw men, and I think the same is true for Will. I'm going to make the case that it is indeed in our national interest from a security, economic, and geostrategic standpoint to continue to support Ukraine and help them defend their sovereign territory. Now, this argument will be based in realism, not fantasy. I choose that word carefully because I know Will calls his position the realist position, so I'm going to steal it. (laughs) Why not not positively self-label your position? So I agree, of course, that foreign policy should be based on realism, but this raises a critical question. How has realism been defined? Is it realistic to assume that placating constant invasions by our strategic adversaries won't eventually embolden them to go past our red lines, invade a NATO country, and drag us into a war? Now, history, and especially European history, tells us that wars always spread when unopposed. And is it it realistic to assume that America, the undisputed world power, can just ignore the world? That logic may have made sense centuries ago, but it makes no sense now. Ukraine might have been six months away in 1850, but in 2022, it only takes 10 hours to get there. The world is smaller. Now, more than ever, actually. And having friends in a dangerous world matters. 
that the United States develops a habit of turning our back on our friends because we're too afraid of provoking our strategic adversaries, then we're going to quickly run out of friends. Refusing to lead is not realism. It's wishing for a world that is different from the real one. It's the opposite of realism. Some say that if we cared about the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Ukraine, then we would push them to agree to a settlement. Now, of course, the only way to leverage Ukraine to do that would be to cut off their aid. So as a realist, what would realistically happen? Would Putin just agree to a settlement out of the kindness of his heart right after his newfound advantage just appeared on his doorstep? That's not reality. Now, the issue before us, this is how I understand the best arguments made on the other side of this debate. I'm going to outline them and then address them. First, NATO's expansion provoked Russia. Number two, America has zero national interest in this conflict. Three, Putin has no interest in compromising Western Europe or NATO, and Russia's threat to the United States has always been exaggerated. Four, our involvement in this war threatens to provoke Russia into potentially a nuclear conflict with the United States. So let's take these one at a time. The argument that NATO or Ukraine provoked Russia into this war ignores several glaring facts. Ukraine was repeatedly rebuffed in its past attempts to join NATO since the turn of the century. Even if Ukraine were a member of NATO, that would not present a significant security threat to Russia. From 1997 to early 2014, NATO did not deploy combat troops to its new member states. Even after Russia invaded Crimea in 2014, NATO's response was pretty subdued, only deploying around 1,500 troops to each of the Baltic states and Poland. By the time Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, the U.S. had removed all its tanks from Germany. Moreover, there are currently five NATO members directly on Russia's border, border, and Russia did not invade any of these, nor did they feel the need to. The threat from Ukraine is also relatively minimal. Ukraine agreed to denuclearize in the 90s while Russia still maintains one of the largest arsenals of nuclear weapons in the world, never mind the fact, of course, that Russia willingly signed the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances in 1994, pledged not to threaten or use military force or economic coercion against Ukraine, Belarus, or Kazakhstan. If anything, it was an American and NATO weakness that has been provocative. There has been a direct and inverse correlation between decreased NATO strength and increased Russian aggression. Biden made it worse. Before the 2022 invasion, Biden had indicated he would accept minor incursions. He canceled weapons transfers to Ukraine. He left our allies in Afghanistan to die. As a result, Putin calculated that the Western response would be minimal. Now, it's important to remember something. The Russians do not think like us. They are of the East. And in places like the Middle East, China and Russia, it is strength that is respected, not goodwill. Appeasement is always seen as an invitation. The realists can believe in a different reality where Putin reasons like we do, but that reality only exists in creative writing assignments. Now let's turn to the argument that is probably most often made, that, that America has zero interest in this conflict. But America has three prime interests in this conflict, security, economic, and geopolitical. From a security standpoint, we know that Putin is not, interested, is not only interested in the eastern regions of Ukraine, and we thought he was, but then he moved to topple Kyiv at the outset of this attack, even after signaling that he would only go for the east and, and Crimea. It is a non-zero threat that if we let Putin take Ukraine, he will continue to move westward and potentially into NATO countries, which should have a direct implications for the United States. It's well known that Putin's military exercises over the past decade are usually offensive in nature, conducting scenarios of invasion in Western Europe. In 2009, for instance, a Russian war game called Zapad, which means the West, simulated an attack on Warsaw, Poland, Stockholm, or on, on Warsaw and Stockholm. They are rarely defensive because Putin knows NATO is not a real threat to them, even though that's the propaganda they put out. And one must also take a step back and consider the alternative scenario had we let Putin take over Ukraine with minimal casualties. This is important. What would the world look like now? What would the world look like if the non-interventionists had their way and Ukraine had never received assistance in the first place? No stingers, no javelins, no way to fend the Russians off in the suburbs of Kyiv. It would look like a belligerent, emboldened, and capable Russia on NATO's border, staring down former Soviet states like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. His military would still be intact, his, his population still strongly behind him. The threat of war with NATO would be far greater and the possibility of sending troops far more likely. And you have to ask yourself, would you really not spend $60 billion, which is what we've sent so far, or even $100 billion, would you really not spend that to eliminate that scenario? And by the way, this is the position that the non-interventionists must defend. Now, Putin's logic is not logical, it's Russian. Putin believes himself to be the great second coming of Peter the Great and shares the 18th century czar's goal of returning Russian lands to the greater empire. He's explicitly stated that he wants to take back territory that once belonged to them. And his actions reinforce this. Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014, over and over again. And now there's fears that they're attempting a coup in Moldova. As far back as 2005, Putin said that Russia should continue its civilizing mission on the Eurasian continent. He's talking about ethnic Russians in places like Latvia, Estonia, and Moldova. 
Now, from an economic standpoint, Ukraine is home to massive deposits of critical minerals. More of these resources, by the way, are connected to the United U.S. economy than is often acknowledged. Just in 2020, Ukraine exported uh, $1.5 billion worth of pig iron. 50% of that came to the United States, not just pig iron. It's also lithium oxide, a source of lithium that's used for modern batteries. Uh, the, if the estimates are correct, Ukraine has the largest lithium reserves in the world. Moreover, about 50% of the world's semiconductor grade neon, critical for chip manufacturing, comes from Ukraine. We really want to allow Russia to have all of this and then hold the world hostage with it? There's also a reason Ukraine is referred to as the breadbasket of the world. 10% of the world wheat market, 13% of the barley market, 15% of the maize market. It's the most important player in the world for sunflower oil, over 50% of world trade. Now the point is this, it is wrong to say Ukraine is insignificant as it relates to the global economy that we all benefit from. Now geopolitical standpoint, it is hard not to see the massive benefit of USAID Ukraine. We have invested a fraction of our annual defense budget to disrupt and dismantle the military of a longtime strategic adversary. That small investment has not only permanently damaged the Russian military, but also united NATO and encouraged free riding Europeans to invest more in their defense. It has delivered a very clear message to China, which is this, wars of conquest will not be tolerated by the West and costs will be far greater for the invader than the rewards will ever be. And if you think China isn't looking at this, at this and checking their stopwatch to see how long that our aid remains firm, you're crazy. They are. Deterring Russia means deterring China too. It is not in America's interest to watch the world around us burn, pretending our oceans offer protection from a highly interconnected international community. We haven't lost a single American soldier either, and yet we still talk about World War III. There simply has not been a downside to this investment. Now, if it's the debt we're concerned about, well, I agree with that. 113 billion appropriated is not nothing. But any educated person here knows that the debt problem comes from our mandatory entitlement spending, not Ukraine. Now let's address the fears of escalation, if I have enough time here. The Russian military is in no position to engage in a direct conflict with any NATO state, given its weakened military. Now, Will's going to say that we contradict ourselves because we say Russia is both weak and strong. That's incorrect. They're weak because of our actions. And, if, and without American involvement, which is Will's position, they would not be weak. So I'm going to address that over right away. The use of nuclear weapons is also overblown. There's not a real reason that they would do that at this point. Doesn't mean we should try to get into Russian territory and provoke them more, but it does mean that our current strategy is sound. Peace through strength cannot just be an empty mantra. It has to mean something. And too often the anti-interventionists forget about the strength part, which is the enforcement mechanism for peace. They would prefer peace at any cost rather than using our strength and sometimes incurring the necessary costs in the present to prevent greater and often unpredictable costs in the future. That's peace through strength. As a realist, I accept the world as it is, not as I wish it were. It's smaller than it was a century ago. And we understand that placating dictators will not bring peace. We understand that America's role requires us to lead. And putting America first is a laudable goal, but it is not America first to allow strategic adversaries to run roughshod over friendly democracies and create chaos to their benefit. That's America last. Thank you. Well, it's great to be back here in Texas. Uh, I lived in uh, Comal County for some time, so it's nice to be back here. Um, so, you know, the question we had before us is whether the United States has a, a responsibility to be a leader on the world stage. And I think the congressman uh, talked about that through the lens of Ukraine, and I'll touch on that. But I want to kind of take it up a, a little bit of a level here and make the claim that there is no responsibility for the U.S. to be a leader on the world stage. And that's because I think the only responsibility that the U.S. government has, if it is going to be true to our Republican values and our constitutional system, is to protect the rights of the members of our political community. Our government is constituted to protect our lives, our liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. Not some amorphous leadership goal, right? Leadership is, is a means to ends, potentially. And the question of what type of leadership is going to be determined by a lot of factors, and I'll go into that in a little bit. But, you know, we hear these mantras from Washington like leadership and responsibility. Well, where do those things come from, right? And I think we have to remember that in a conservative regime, one that's dedicated to limited government and individual liberty, as opposed to grand projects and idealistic goals, 
that we have to think carefully about what it means and the costs of performing those actions that are alleged to be our responsibility. I think our responsibility, the responsibility of a constitutional order like our own, is to do its job in foreign policy by protecting three things. One, our territorial integrity, right? Our safety and security here at home. Two, the conditions of our economic prosperity. And three, our Republican order here at home. So those are the things that I think we, our government does have a responsibility for. And the question is, what are those means? So pursuing something like leadership or the rights of other people outside of our own country, detached from these ends and disconnected from our national interests is beyond the scope of what a just government entails. Instead, it is especially violative of our social contract to do so when such, in, such aims increase the risk of being dragged into a war, especially one that could escalate to a nuclear exchange while requir requiring greater taxation and sacrifice. Again, there are times in which you have to sacrifice your blood and treasure abroad to secure your vital national interest, the three things I talked about. But the notion that you have some leadership responsibility that may incur the need to sacrifice that blood and treasure disconnected or only through some kind of indirect chain of logic to your national interests, I think is just uh, irresponsible rather than responsible. So what I would say, to go back to another hallmark of the conservative tradition, Pat Buchanan, is America first, second, and third, not some type of amorphous leadership responsibility. So our government does have responsibilities to us, right? And in foreign affairs, we have to serve our national interests and to do so prudently. Now, how we do that isn't, isn't fixed, right? It's not specified up front. Right? We don't talk about, at least on my side of the aisle, sacred allies. We talk about how allies are means to ends. We talk about how it's important to have a strong national defense, but what that means at any particular time is going to vary. It will depend on a number of different factors, like the threat environment we face. Clearly, the threat environment in 1995 was different than the threat environment in 1941 and it's going to require a different approach. The balance of power is going to be critical. You know, I referenced 1995. The United States was in its unipolar moment. There were no serious rivals around the globe. Again, a very different circumstance from 1947, when the United States needed to construct an array of alliances to deal with the threat of communist Soviet Union. Geography matters a lot. The congressman talked about geography. The world's a smaller place. Sure, in some ways. But geography matters still. How are the Chinese going to do the million-man swim to get to the United States 5,000 miles away? Europe is thousands of miles away. Blue water, right? It's hard to project power across that water. And yes, the world is smaller in many ways. But as we've seen in Ukraine, it's important to be able to get men and material to the battlefield. And it was very difficult to imagine that the United States uh, could be threatened seriously in terms of our shores, given our fortunate geographic position. Not only do we have those two big moats between us and the rest of the world, but we also have weak neighbors and they're friendly. Right? Canada's friendly, it's also not very populous. They bandwagon with us. So we don't have to worry so much about that. And as long as we dominate the Western Hemisphere, support the Monroe Doctrine, then we do have very little danger to our territorial integrity coming from abroad. So that's one of the reasons why John Quincy Adams would be as relevant today as he was back in 1821. Because a lot of the times when we go abroad, we go abroad in search of monsters to destroy not things that are actual dangers to those vital national interests that I just talked about, that are worth sacrificing your sons and your daughters, my sons in particular. Okay, my sons are 16 and 18. The things we talk about have great gravity 
especially in those cases, and you as well. So there's no one-size-fits-all approach, I think, to how we should look at the world. Uh, and so in George Washington's time, from, from George Washington's farewell address, the Neutrality Proclamation, until 1898, the United States followed George Washington's great rule of non-entanglement and non-interference. That served our purpose as well. We rose to great power status, not because we had a global responsibility that we adopted, because we put America first, second, and third here at home. We had a relatively peaceful 100 years in which the United States problems were here. We had the awful civil war that we needed to fight to perfect our system of liberal democracy, but we didn't have these massive conflagrations that we fought abroad. And that was good for us. Our economy grew. We focused on those things that made us so powerful so that eventually we could choose to go abroad if we needed to. And I think that it's important to remember that, that military power isn't the only way that we can engage in the world in a productive fashion to secure our national interests. Again, not because of some amorphous leadership role. You know, we can use statecraft to do that. Um, but we have to say, you know, look, when we think about, I think, the purposes of just government, like I said, we have to think about the fact that it's, it's got to be an issue of prudence. So what does prudence look like today? It served us well to follow a restrained approach from Washington about 1898. Then we went abroad in search of Monster Destroy, fought a civil war in the Philippines that was quite destructive. William Graham Sumner, a famous intellectual at the time, talked about that war as one that the Spanish actually won because what happened is Americans' uh, uh, society, America, America's uh, government became more like Imperial Spain than like the tradition that our founders bestowed upon us. Now, of course, with the rise of Nazi Germany and the threat that that imposed upon the world and the United States, we took a different approach. We likewise did so during the Cold War. Because again, I'm a realist, we look at the world as it is, and at that time it was required to do something different than what Washington had counseled us. But with the end of the Cold War, in the period from 1989 to 1991, the world changed, but American foreign policy didn't. We put that containment approach, that primacist approach on steroids, and we fought 20 years of forever wars in which we spent massive blood and treasure. 7,000 Americans died in Iraq and Afghanistan. 58,000 were, were wounded. About a million disability claims. We spent trillions of taxpayer dollars on what? Leadership? Responsibility? No. We wasted blood and treasure that would be better used here at home and better used to deal with the most important foreign policy challenges of our future, like China. So I think we have to be really careful about assuming some of these kind of notions of like a responsibility to protect or a global leadership. And the idea that with great power comes great responsibility it looks like a great thing for a bumper sticker, but what the heck does that mean? Okay. Again, in a, in, a, in, the, with the, in a system of laws, with a social contract, there is a responsibility in particular to those that are a party to that, and that means keeping us safe here at home, protecting the conditions of our economy, uh, of our economic prosperity, and making sure that what we do abroad doesn't boomerang back on us and undermine our liberal democratic system. I'll talk more about Ukraine in the, uh, in the discussion, and we'll see how our, my approach to the world, one of realism and restraint, would look like in the particulars, including in Ukraine. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you both for that. I think the, the issue is well and truly joined. Let's stick with Ukraine, since I think that's probably on everyone's mind, first and foremost. Today, the Biden administration announced that it would issue $2 billion, with a B, more in aid to Ukraine. Uh, how long should we keep providing aid? But I want, to put, I want to make the question even more painful for each of you, so I have a slightly different variant for you. For Congressman Crenshaw, would you be willing to continue aid at present levels for, say, 10 years, if that's what it takes to prevent Ukrainian defeat? And for Dr. Ruger, would you be willing to cut off aid immediately, even if that would ensure a swift Ukrainian defeat? 
Maybe we can start with Dr. Ruger this time. Yeah, so I'm, I have a conservative mindset. I, I think rapid change it can be destabilizing and is not necessarily the most prudent or wise way to engage. So I don't think that necessarily you'd snap your fingers and cut that off. But I do believe that we need to, uh, we need to find a way to put pressure on the Ukrainians uh, and the Russians to come to a negotiated settlement. That's going to be very difficult, okay? because as long as both sides believe that they can uh, do better on the battlefield than at the diplomatic table, then they're going to continue to fight. But I, I want to kind of turn the table on the question in some ways, because back to what I was just saying, the purpose of American power, the purpose of spending blood and treasure is to secure our vital national interests. And I don't think very many national interests are implicated by what's happening in Ukraine. I feel terrible as a human being for what's happening to Ukrainians, but I also felt really badly over the last 20 years for what was happening in Central Africa, where thousands and thousands of people were being killed and dying in conflict. But I didn't hear a lot of people talk about intervening there. I feel terrible for what's going to happen to the future of Afghanistan, even though we've left, and I believe we should have left, and I was an advocate for doing so. But it's not America's role to secure the interests of other countries. And I don't believe what the congressman said is correct, that there's a seamless web of interests here, that what is good for Ukraine is good for the United States. We were able to, uh, to do quite well during the Cold War when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. We still won the Cold War. We were still safe. Why? Those big moats, our good allies in Europe that helped deter against Russia and the Soviet Union. We have nuclear weapons. We have a strong conventional deterrent. The other thing is today Russia is weak. $65 billion military budget. We've spent more than that on Ukraine. We spend more than 10 times that on our, on our military every year. That doesn't even count for our allies. They have, you know, Russia has a weak economy. It's not a very strong economy, right? It's about the size of Italy's. We don't worry about them, do we? What is implicated by the war in Ukraine is the danger that we could get into an escalatory spiral from over-engaging that could lead to the piercing of the nuclear taboo and potentially an exchange between us and the Russians. That's what scares me. Okay. Congressman? So we're still debating Ukraine, because yes, nobody Russia. said it for like 10 minutes, and we're I was like, question. did I get the wrong email? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's great. Uh, you know, because there's not a lot that Will said on, in his opening that I disagree with. I, dis I disagree with how he, uh, I think, interprets reality and as far as how far away people are. You know, yeah, it's true. China can't send a million men over the ocean here, but they can send a hypersonic right into this building. So it's not the 1800s. It's quite different. And, and, and our posture has to be different. National defense does not mean Navy SEALs like me sitting on the beaches in Coronado just waiting for the Chinese. Like, that's not what national security means. It's forward presence. It's alliances. Um, it, that's national security. Uh, okay, but but on the Ukraine, no, no, we, we, we don't. It's it's not a tough question as far as do we do we commit for ten years? We should say it publicly, yeah. But we don't actually have to make that decision now. You take it day by day. You take it day by day as you always do, as 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 you would any foreign policy uh, uh, issue. That that that's why I also kind of agree with Will. I I, I don't. I don't subscribe to this amorphous leadership role in the world kind of mentality because the answer is it always depends. It's not always true that we need to go save somebody in the, around the world. It is not always true. It is true when it makes sense. And in the case of Ukraine, it makes sense. And I, I detailed very, very clearly why it is in our nation, national interest from a security standpoint, from the potential for security chaos. Uh, erupting in Europe and beyond because it always keeps going every single time. It's hard to anticipate exactly where it's going, but it always keeps going. It very rarely stays put, especially in Europe. Economically, I made the case very clearly why Ukraine uh, is, is not some insignificant player on the world stage. Um, and then from a geostrategic standpoint, again, just for, for, for the costs we've incurred, I get a fraction of our military budget on an annual basis. Wh why not get what we've gotten here? Uh, you know. So I'm going to, Congressman, I'm going to come right back to you next. Uh, on the subject of allies, with both, with both, which uh, both of you mentioned, I came with some numbers here. Many European states, who of course most of whom are NATO members, spend less than 2%, which is the NATO target of their GDP on defense each year. Japan only recently committed to reaching 2%. They haven't reached it yet. Germany only recently committed to reaching 2%. They've underspent that for many years, and their military, unfortunately, is barely functional in many cases. 
Taiwan, which faces an existential threat to its existence, only recently exceeded 2%. And if you look at a graph of Chinese military spending in Taiwanese, the Chinese line is up and to the right, and the Taiwanese line is basically flat, which is shocking when you consider the threat that they live under. Meanwhile, the United States will spend roughly 3.5% of our GDP this year on defense, which is a low number for us compared to most recent years uh, in the post-World War II era. Why should we spend so much uh, on defense to defend countries that are more threatened than we are who then spend so little on themselves? And separately, but relatedly, why can't Europe deter Russia on its own, given that Europe's GDP dwarfs that of Russia? Well, they should. I mean, there's, there's a plenty of agreement there. Uh, this administration has been very weak, I think, shaming the Europeans to the, to the, necessarily. So um, it's obviously not all European countries you use Germany as an example because they're the worst. They should be some of the best. But, you know, they've got a weird history with their military. So I get it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but you look at Poland and the Baltic states, they're, 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 they're going above and beyond on this, uh, on, on Ukraine especially. You know, if we, if we end up looking at more aid packages, which isn't even which isn't even obvious that we will. There's about, there's over 40 billion completely unspent right now. You know, it, w people throw out numbers all the time. I've got those numbers in detail if people really want to understand what's actually been spent, where it goes, how much actually goes to Ukraine versus how much comes actually right back to us. Um, it's, it, there's a lot of misinformation about that. Uh, we don't have to go into that if you don't want to, but um, they should, there's no disagreement there. And, and we, in our, it should be actively within our foreign policy to get them to do that. I would say one of the geostrategic advantages of this current situation is that they're all agreeing that they at least have to do it, that the world is more dangerous than they thought it was. Is there a moral hazard if we agree to take up the burden that reduces their incentive to potentially? It, it is. Every time we, I, I agree. I mean, look, the, every, every time Biden asks for a new portion of money for this, it should, it should be very clear that he has done everything he can to make the Europeans match it, especially on the humanitarian aid side. I mean, if they're so afraid of providing weapons or they simply don't have the weapons, why are we doing all the humanitarian aid? I think there's more agreement there than you might suspect. Dr. Luger. Yeah, I think there's massive moral hazard, and there have, has been for decades. And we should have taken a, a different approach after the end of the Cold War. That was a time in which we could have safely transitioned to a system where we would defend the Western Hemisphere, we would, we would look towards the Pacific, and Europe, which is wealthy and populous, the EU countries combined are as wealthy and more populous than we are, they could have handled what isn't really actually that much of a threat from Russia, as we've seen. I mean, Russia has the ability to threaten its neighbors, right, its weak neighbors, uh, but it doesn't have the ability to threaten Europe as a whole. Uh, and we should have pushed harder on that. Now the question is, well, what do we do now? Well, every time, in, and this is the problem of moral hazard, right? Every time you do something for someone else, they rationally chisel, right? They buck pass, they free ride. And so we really need to, to put down some markers here. And President Trump, I think, did a, a decent job of trying to browbeat them. But, you know, the Europeans, particularly the Germans, are fantastic at basically trying to tell us what we want to hear and then doing nothing. And they've made promises over Ukraine. And look, I'll believe it when I see it, because this is a country that has treated us like Uncle Sucker, right? That's what U.S. stands for, according to many of our European allies. And I'm tired of it, frankly. Uh, I, you know, I used to go to Stuttgart a lot for the Navy. I go to Europe on a fair amount as part of my job here. And I go there, and I see, it, and I see the fact that they are able to have more butter because we're spending on the guns. And that butter looks like better infrastructure, fantastic airports, the ability to spend money in ways that I, I don't want us to, like social welfare programs. I'd rather have it returned to value creators like the people in this room. Uh, but the fact is, is that we suffer a great opportunity cost from the fact that we are being treated by Uncle Su as Uncle Sucker by not just our European allies, but also those in Asia. And that those numbers on Taiwan uh, suggest that uh, they either don't see the same threat or they're unwilling to do anything but buck pass to my kids to fight on their beaches. Let's talk about Taiwan for a moment. Uh, defense strategist Elbridge Colby, whom I think uh, both of you know in, in some respect, argues that Taiwan and not Europe should be the focus of American defense planning and that we have an overriding interest in denying China the ability to invade and conquer Taiwan in order to prevent China from dominating Asia and thereby dominating the globe economically, militarily, and so forth. Uh, Congressman, should America defend Taiwan if it's attacked, and why or why not? Depends on what you mean by defend. Uh, if you, by defend, you mean doing the same thing we're doing with Ukraine, then absolutely, yes. It would be nice if we just prevented it. 
which we didn't do with Ukraine. Again, Biden weakness caused that. Um, but you can make Taiwan a porcupine. It, it, and again, deterring Russia right now deters China. They are absolutely watching. They're watching it in multiple respects. One, how long does the West last? And two, oh, this invasion stuff isn't as easy as we might have thought it was. We've never actually fought a war. And so I think they're, they're, cal they're recalculating that. Um, there's, there's another argument made, like, oh, we, you, can't, you can't support Ukraine because it's, it's diverting resources from Taiwan, the real threat. Uh, that's nonsense. Totally different kinds of weapon systems. If anything, we're at a better, in a better place now because we finally uncovered how crappy our military industrial complex is um, and doesn't work the way we need it to. It's, it's been retooled for a couple decades now for, towards a counterterrorism operation when it needs to be back to a near peer com uh, competition. In Taiwan, you need surface to air missiles, you need uh, uh, ship killing missiles, you, know, you need to defend an island. It's a very different uh, uh, set of realities there. So, um, not that you even asked that question, but I, I might as well get ahead of it. Uh, I, I, nobody wants to be in a position where you're going to uh, send troops to Taiwan. See, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a DC think tank, recently ran a very sophisticated war game of Taiwan invasion scenarios, and they found that really U.S. military intervention, immediate, forceful, 100% U.S. military intervention is needed to defeat a, t a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. With, with the so way we, things are now, I mean, we're like $20 billion behind on, on weapons orders to Taiwan. So it, it, there's, there's a real problem with making the stuff that they need and delivering it. If you do that, that, that'll change that scenario quite a bit. President Biden said, this may have been a blunder, but he said that, that we would fight. Do you support that position? I, I support him keeping it vague. <laughs> I, want, I, I think that strategic ambiguity is, is important here. The Chinese need to think you might do it. The, the Russians thought Trump would bomb mask, Moscow because he said so, right? Did he mean it? I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> but neither did Putin. Like, that's the whole point. So, you know, our, this, this is an advantage that dictators have over us is, is you know, I know that if I say something, it's, it's important that, that, that my adversaries hear it. But unfortunately, everybody here is going to call me a warmonger. And I can't be like, I didn't mean it. You know, like, it's just let me say it because that's part of our strategic deterrence. Xi Jinping gets to do that. Putin gets to do that because there is no press. There's just there's singular thinking. So. It's, it's a disadvantage that we have. Um, we have many other advantages, of course. Uh, I, I think the way they've run this war is, is, is obvious. It's obvious that being a dictator is not helpful. People don't want to tell you things. People don't want to deliver you bad news. Um, and we, we, should, we should take note of that, use it to our advantage. The Chinese, I think, are in the same boat. Dr. Ruger, is Taiwan an indispensable linchpin in American defense, or is it a distraction that's going to drag us into a great power war? Uh, I also support strategic ambiguity uh, because I think it would be destabilizing to go one way or the other. Uh, but I, to answer your question more directly, I just think it's hard to imagine that a small island 80 miles off the coast of China, thousands and thousands of miles away from the United States, is critical to the safety and economic prosperity of a continental-sized country like ours. I mean, again, I feel for these people. I, I used to teach every summer in Hong Kong. And I love Hong Kong, or I loved what Hong Kong was, a great testimony to the virtues of a free market economy. But I mourn at what, at what has happened to Hong Kong without thinking that the United States should have done anything about it. Right? Again, it's not our role to make sure that other countries have the same type of opportunities that we have here at home. It's unfortunate, but again, geography matters. It is so close to China. Their ability to resupply missiles, torpedoes, defensive capabilities and offensive capabilities where we're thousands of miles away, even Guam and Okinawa and Japan are far away, be very difficult to do this. So in a way, I would say, like, even if I wanted to do that, even if I thought Taiwan was so critical to our future, I just look at it as a wicked problem, as they say, right? And, and to solve that problem, I don't see it at, the, at, a, at a cost that would be, I think, um, that, that really fit the benefit. And, and so I think what do we, the thing we have to do is, are there critical, say, technologies or capabilities that the Taiwanese have that we wouldn't want to fall under the, uh, under the Chinese uh, uh, command? So, or we wouldn't want to see destroyed? So, and so we might want to do something, and again, I'm against industrial policy generally because I think it leads to cronyism and corporate welfare and bad economic performance, but there might be specific areas where you may need to onshore that so that if they went, if and when they fall under the Chinese, 
assuming, again, that the Chinese don't want to just sell it to us, because they like to sell all kinds of things from Hong Kong and Shanghai. They probably would with Taiwan as well. But in case they didn't and we had decoupling totally, we wouldn't want to lose those capabilities like with chips. To press yeah. the point a bit, you say that you support strategic ambiguity, which is the idea that we might come in to defund Taiwan. And presumably, you support maintaining the military capability to make that at least credible. But if China goes forward with an invasion, which military experts say that they might in the very near future, your advice to the president would be not to intervene. Yeah, you don't say out loud everything you think. You and can say it, though. Right, but if you're, if you're advising princes or kings I or... or yeah. right, yeah. I don't have to answer. Or politicians. <laughs> uh, right, I mean, again, I, I think that there are times in which you simply have to say no. I mean, and, and oftentimes, again... Uh, no is, is the right decision in many cases. I mean, I wish we had, I wish we had said no more often in American history. Yeah. It, it, it's worth noting just because we're wondering why Taiwan even matters, just real quick, and you know, why it, prevention is so important, because 90% of advanced semiconductors are made in Taiwan, and it's very, very difficult to replicate that. Every single thing you like in the world is because of a semiconductor. So it, it's, it's, it's a pretty massive consequence right, right off the bat. But wouldn't it be cheaper to take that capability lock, stock, and barrel and move it here? Well, we're trying. to fight I mean, a war with China? Well, we're trying with the, the industrial uh, policy that you hate so much and the CHIPS Act. <laughs> so, no, again, but I'm it's a, not going to work even. I mean, you talk to experts, and that's $50, 60000000000 billion that we're spending to subsidize companies to do exactly that. I voted against it because I have the same philosophy you do, yeah. generally speaking. Uh, it would have been better to massage it a little bit, make it a tax credit. That's not important. The point is, even in the most rosiest uh, of colored lenses, we might increase our production a few percentage points. Yeah. Everybody says that. So it's, it's almost impossible. Yeah, but again, I think if we're saying that it's possible to fight a war with a nuclear power like China 80 miles from their coast, but it's impossible to bring some chip factories to the United States, I think we can do it. Eventually, yeah. Yeah. And again, I don't, think we, I don't think we have reconciled ourselves because we've been fighting these, these you know, dangerous but minor actors in the kind of you know, in the, the sands of, of the Middle East, how, how a war with, with a, a near-peer competitor like China would go. I mean, it's a little bit like what happened in 1914 when they hadn't fought a, a big war in Europe for 45 years. And think about all the technology, technological changes that had happened at the end of the 19th century compared to what was happening in, in 1914. And, and they were shocked, right? generations of Oxford and Cambridge students, or a generation of Oxford and Cambridge students killed in a war that they thought would be over relatively quickly. My worry is that we cannot handle, as a society, we had a hard time handling COVID, right? Remember all the COVID Karens out there? Imagine if their kids were being sent and sunk in the Pacific, right? One aircraft carrier goes down. How many men and women is that? About four or 5,000 at once. Imagine that. I see our question card circulating. We'd love to get some audience questions going here. One more question from me in the meantime. Uh, the realist scholar John Mearsheimer has derided our activist or interventionist foreign policy as a giant jobs program for the Washington elite. And of course, he's not the only critic. Donald Trump famously in 2016 in the South Carolina, South Carolina primary, primary, uh, primary debate attacked interventionist foreign policy and specifically the Iraq war head on and then surprised many experts about Republican politics by winning the primary and indeed the nomination. Is there a gap between the American people and the Beltway experts who make foreign policy? And does the gap, if it exists, produce a more interventionist foreign policy than the American people want? Congressman, you are a representative of some of the American people, so you can take this one first. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm trying to think through the, the, that quote from, who was it, Mearsham? Mir Mir John Mearsheimer. So I don't even know what that means. It's a jobs program for Washington elite. Okay. I think uh, am I Washington elite? You know, the guy with one eye from Gloss in Afghanistan, I guess. I, I just, I, I think that he's, he's supposed to be smarter than that. So that's a cheap, that's a, this is a kind of a cheap talking point. And, but you do hear it a lot, right? There's the elites and all, I'm like, I'm waiting to find them. In, in Washington, to be honest, and this military industrial complex that's supposedly so powerful and lines are pockets and what, not, what have you, it's just nonsense. And anyone who tells you that, you just know ahead of time they're about to lie to you. They don't know what they're talking about. They're not, you're not getting your door knocked on by, by, by Northrop Grumman, and they're not, dude, you better go to war, Dan. Like, it's not, this is bullshit. I mean, I just, I, I just, it really annoys me because it's just, it's so anti-intellectual. Let's make intellectual arguments here. That guy should know better. Um, Trump, 
uh, look, everybody was skeptical about the Iraq war. We, we could talk about that if, you, if you'd like. I mean, in hindsight, yeah, it, it's like, yeah, should we have done that? It's not, it's not a crazy thing to think. Um, it was crazy to think once we were there that we should just leave and see what happens. Like, that was crazy. And then Trump went back in and killed a bunch of ISIS guys. So it's not like he's this isolationist, right? And, but, but some people who follow him and look to him paint him as such. But, I mean, that guy murdered Soleimani, an Iranian general, while, we, while he was on a layover in Baghdad. That's not exactly a non-interventionist. I mean, and it was awesome. And everybody thought, <laughs> yeah. And everybody's like, World War III. And then Iran was like, Ugh, you know, because that's what deterrence means, right? You, you've got you've to make them know that you're going to over deter them. You're going to beat them on the escalation ladder. What was the question? Oh, the people. <laughs> All right, so the people versus the elite. Like, OK, it, no, I mean, like, look, the, the, it's your job as a representative to to study the facts and, and, and be honest. You, what you run on is a set of principles. This is how I'm going to think about a problem. You generally know where I'm at. You generally know how I, I pursue truth, okay? And then you trust me to do it. That's what, representative, that's what a representative is. If you want to just me to take a poll on every single bill, okay, I'll just be a robot. I'll just be a robot on every single bill. We'll just take a poll and then see how the, how the electorate votes. Um, people spend very little time thinking about complex foreign policy matters. Okay, so it, it is our job to, to do it. Um, and you know, as far as if there's a disconnect, you, you just gotta be more specific. Right now, they, if we're talking about Ukraine, uh, again, I thought that was the point of this debate, the, there, you still got a majority of Americans in, in favor of aiding Ukraine. Not doing too much, but not doing nothing either. So uh, at least on that subject, we're, we're about spot on. on. On other foreign policy issues, it might not be. But we'd have to talk about those. We'd have to dissect that individually. Yeah, so I, there is a Washington foreign policy establishment. Um, National Review talked about the establishment long, long ago. It, it exists. Um, I and just haven't met any of them. <laughs> well, you haven't been to the Atlantic Council, funded by Burisma and other places, right? I mean, look, I there is a foreign policy elite. elite. Uh, one of my jobs uh, before I came to, to, to become the president of AIER was to help develop a counter elite to go after the elite on foreign policy that was getting us into these forever wars and keeping us there. So there is one. Uh, I mean, this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, President Obama talked about the blob. President Trump talked about the deep state, and he should have added to that, that establishment within Washington, the think tanks that are funded by foreign governments, that are funded by the military industrial complex, and in some cases funded by honest Americans who just like that approach to the world, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's certainly a whole cohort of actors in Washington that their aim is to promote their ideas, and, those, and these ideas are, are, are sometimes uh, I think wrong, uh, and, th and again, the battle of ideas should happen, but there is this, and they go in and out of government, the, right? Toria Newland, uh, who has been responsible for a lot of the mess in our policy towards Russia, has gone in and out of, she's in the State Department, she's a political appointee, she was the head of a Washington think tank, and, and, and it's, again, it's, it's not something that's like a conspiracy, it's out in the open, it's public. But the fact is, is that there is a mindset, a group think in Washington that does, and, and again, these people oftentimes benefit from this um, kind of aggressive interventionist uh, approach to the world. Um, many times it's not their kids that are in the military. And many times, uh, if something does go wrong, their careers just get better. It's all about why I liked what President Trump said in the Mayflower Address in 2016. I was in the audience, and he said, you know, he wanted to hire people who, who, didn't, who weren't like people who had been hired before, people with a long, uh, who had, had great credentials but a long history of failure. That's the Washington establishment. And I think we need a different type of approach, one that is more consistent, I think, with the needs of Americans, because I think Americans do have a disconnect from the way the Washington foreign policy establishment thinks about what's worth fighting and dying for, particularly because it's their kids who might have to fight and die. Think tanks don't make policy. You know, there's, there's, you talk to any member of Congress, there's, the only thing they care about is what kind of phone calls they're getting and are those phone calls constituents from the district. It's the only thing they care about. This has, been a, this has been this boogeyman forever. The establishment. What is the establishment? What is this power the establishment has? Whose pockets are they lining? I, again, I, just, I, I live it every single day, and it drives me crazy, this, this kind of line of thinking, because it makes people paranoid. It makes, it makes our voters 
just just sick to their stomachs. It makes them angry and mad. And I'm like, geez, it's just not what you think it is. So, so were you okay. getting? So were people in Congress getting tons of calls for staying in Afghanistan so that we could build girls' schools in Helmand? They weren't getting calls from that. That's not what the people. They're wanted. also not getting calls right? that we it's need David, to leave right now. Right, but it's David Petraeus and others that are part of that that keep promoting a certain vision of the future. So is this democ- is, Isn't this what democracy is? Like different interest groups pitted, pitted against each other sure, with different but, but ideas. Who represents the people, especially when the, it's not the people in general that are funding? You know, these. So, these so, the, pe- so the people have this this singular opinion in, 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 is what we're what we're trying to. Like their children. No, I mean, w- w- what I'm they're, saying they're, is that they're it, different. I mean, your neighbors yeah. have ten different opinions. Sure, but when it comes to a pocketbook issue like taxes, right, or something like wokeness in our schools, that's directly in, we're directly involved in that, and we can see it in our community. When it comes to foreign policy, elites give cues because people are busy with their lives. They don't know that, for example, that Zelensky was connected to an oligarch. Uh, named Kolomoisky. They don't know about the Azov Battalion uh, and its connection with some some pretty uh, unsavory uh, kind of ideology. They don't know about you know the d- the defense budget and what that means and how that connects to or compares to other countries. So they look to elites. They look to John McCain or Donald Trump or George W. Bush or Bernie Sanders. They look to these people for cues. But the fact is, is a lot of the cues aren't just given by elected officials. They're given by scholars, by think tankers. And the people that work in your offices go to talks given by these think tankers. And there's a sense that emerges in this about what the right ideas are. I mean, I remember in 2004 when I was... It might be because they're the right ideas sometimes. No, but I remember (laughs) in 2004, 2005, and I was against the Iraq war right from the beginning. I thought it was going to be a disaster. It was. And everybody wants to go back and say, like, yeah, I thought it was a bad idea, but I kind of went along with it. But no, I was out in front of that in the beginning. But when I came to Washington in 2004, 2005, everybody was like, oh, it's the Pottery Barn Principle. I heard that from like everybody. You thought that it had been like a spontaneous order had gone out to use that that trope. You break it, you buy it. Yeah, you break it, you buy it. That was the trope for a long time and everybody kept repeating it and then it gets on the TV shows at night and everybody says it and pretty soon the public is like, well, you know, those smart people in Washington are telling me I gotta follow the Pottery Barn principle. And, that, and then we go down the line listening to these people and going over a cliff. I do want to. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know next time I get a phone call to the office that one of my constituents read a, a white paper from a local, from a, a blob. No, no, but that's not what I, <laughs> like, that, no. But But again, that's not what I said. I'm saying that people like you, pe- people, people in Washington create a kind of intellectual. We've been brainwashed. I got it. No, All not, right, let's move on to the next okay. It's not brainwashed. <laughs> We've been... It's not, it's cue giving. And that's an important thing that congressmen like you do. Since, since we are talking about the people, I do want to give the Vox Populi that's present in the room here a chance to opine. (laughs) Fortunately, some of the questions seem to gather around similar themes. And then I'm going to give each of you a chance to wrap up and thereby address some of these points if you wish to. We have a question here about international economic interdependence and the fact that Russia's invasion threatens the stability that's the basis for that. And this person thinks that the U.S. should be a major player in the reaction there. Uh, This uh, person, Chris, thank you, Chris, Uh, argues or seems to imply that the U.S. um, needs to maintain its role as the benevolent hegemonic power to preserve the global economic system. Uh, We have a comment here that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not about merely about Ukraine or Taiwan, but about large powers threatening the U.S. and Europe, and why would we shrink from that threat? And then here is one in a different vein that's interesting. Uh, It says, Putin is arguing that he represents traditional moral values, while we are using the national security community to advance Marxist DEI agendas, how effective will an extended engagement be if we have no moral power? And that is certainly an argument that you hear in some strains of the right these days, which perhaps it would be interesting to address. I'll address that one. Uh, Putin is not a Christian. Can we stop? Let's, let's stop kidding ourselves here. It's a mass murderer who, who allows his soldiers to rape children in front of their parents until they bleed to death. That's what happened in Bucha. I've got many eyewitness accounts. I've got Americans who were there and seen it. So, yeah, this guy's not a Christian. Let's not pretend that he's also not the best manipulator the world knows right now, the KGB or master manipulators. If you don't like Marxism and wokeism, thank the Russians. They're the ones who did it to us, right? For years and years and years, about 80, 90 percent of their of their funding for intelligence operations was not towards the cool spy stuff like you see in the show, The Americans. It was for information operations, and it's very effective, and they're very, very good at it. They know how to pit us against each other. I mean, they did it recently, right? I mean, I don't think as effectively as the left likes to think they did, but they did try to do it. 
right? They're always trying to do it, and they're very good at it. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the reasoning that, like, that Putin has used for why he invaded Ukraine, like the bio labs, he didn't even think of that. That was like our, our right-wing conspiracists thought of that, and Putin's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> like, there's no bio weapons, there's no weapons bio labs, Azov battalion, that is really overblown. Like, really, really overblown. Everybody knows that. It, it, I've really gone into this and went, I went to Ukraine. Like, we've, and, and, and talked to people who are, are not Ukrainian also. Like, there's, 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 there's a lot of, I think, conspiratorial thinking about who these people are. And there's this attempt to dehumanize them, and I think in, in a way that's really, really gross. It's one thing to say, it's okay, it's not in our interest, and I've, I've given my, my, my reasons for why I disagree with that. I don't need to repeat them, but it's quite another to try and dehumanize them. You know, Putin is not standing up for traditional values. You, That's nonsense. Stepping away from Ukraine for a second, do you think there's any connection between the moral and social developments taking place in the United States and our ability to project influence globally? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like woke stuff, so I think there's a pretty vast <laughs> agreement there. Um, it, it does nothing but hurt us. I, I don't know if it matters internationally as much as, as, as much as we might believe, but it matters internally. I mean, it's worth the fight just here at home. I, I Marxist thinking is, is, is much worse than just economic redistribution. I mean, it's, it, it, it cuts deep at the core of, of our individuals, a sense of an individual. So yeah, it's pretty dangerous. Again, thank the Russians. They, they infected our universities with it back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and they were very, very good at it. Um, they recruited Americans to be part of that movement. It's one of the reasons we have the nonsense that we're dealing with now. And Dr. Ruger, you'll have the last word. I mean, I, I'm, I only defend America's virtues and values and interests, so I don't have to say anything good about Putin to argue with the representative. I, I think he's a bad guy. I think Russia is a regime that is unsavory. Um, you know, to me, it's just a matter of, of kind of looking at it squarely and coldly and just saying, I don't think that Ukraine is a linchpin of, 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 a free society, of our free society. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think that Putin represents you know, American values or Christian values, he, he's a bad guy. What, what should I say? But what I do think we have to be careful about is the fact that we do have the internationalization of the culture war here at home. And I think this is understated. And I, I would love to see the representative explore how the State Department is trying to internationalize that culture war. You know, why are they trying to jam certain views about the nature of society and, and the nature of morality abroad, right? Uh, I mean, this kind of reminds me, there was a, Andy Basevich, a, a, a colonel in the, uh, in the army and a professor at Boston University, uh, he one time re reviewed a book by a neoconservative, and he said, like, wow, these neoconservatives, they say that American society is terrible and they want to export it, <laughs> right? I don't want to do that where we're saying, you know, look, we hate what's happening in our country around us when it comes to, you know, DEI, wokeness and, and equity. Um, and let's keep making sure we fund the State Department to export those ideas. Instead, let's make sure that our public diplomacy is, again, focused very coldly on what is our interests, presenting a positive picture of our experiment in liberty and democracy, but also making sure that we're very careful and that what, we, what we're doing abroad isn't actually going to boomerang against us. Well, thank you both for your thoughtful contributions. I think this is a wonderful microcosm of a very fertile, very important debate that's happening not, not just within American society, but specifically within the conservative movement and the Republican Party. Uh, and this has given us a real preview of what we can look forward to in the years ahead. Thank you to the audience for your questions and to our hosts here at Old Parkland and the National Review Institute. Good night. Good night.